Well, welcome. I'm really pleased to be here with my colleagues and to welcome all of you. Um, today, we're going to talk about the power of research to advance the SDGs. And uh, I'm Sarah Jones, and I have with me uh, two colleagues that I'm excited to, to hear their presentations, uh, Dr. Marcia Balciano and uh, Dr. Lewis Collins. Um, so I'm just going to speak for just a few minutes before we jump into the presentation um, about uh, what we're doing at Arizona State around the SDGs. And then we will have uh, Dr. Balciano will be sharing, uh, I think it's, is, I don't even know if it's released yet or if it is hot off the presses report from Relics, um, which I'm very excited to see. And then uh, Dr. Collins will be commenting on that. So move ahead here. Okay, so like I said, I'm Sarah Jones. I am the Director for Global Partnerships at Arizona State University. Um, and, uh, you know, it's interesting as I've been reflecting, been working with SDGs for a while now and been reflecting that um, internationally, I think um, for a lot of universities, the SDGs have been much more of a prominent framework um, than what I've noticed for many universities in the United States. And I think that's changing. I'm, I'm happy to say that I think that's changing. Um, but this is something that um, both through uh, the work that we've been doing on the Times Higher Ed and the impact, I think that was in some ways a catalyst for us to start to look at the work that we've been, we've been doing the work in the SDGs for quite a while, but it's really given us a new framework or a new way to think about the work that we're doing. So um, I'm, I'm excited to say that it is becoming much more of a focus for us at ASU and how we organize around the SDGs. So just about that with you. Um, so just a little bit about ASU, um, our, uh, you know, this is our charter and our design aspirations. And I was just pulling these up because some of the features I think of, you know, and this is uh, our, our president, Michael Crow, developed the charter and design aspirations about 16 years ago now. Um, so predating the SDGs, but there's a couple points there that really um, do align kind of with the work that we're doing in SDGs. Um, in particular, our charter, um, you know, uh, one of the prominent features of our charter is inclusion and access. So we, we say we're, we're defined not by who we, who we exclude, but who we include and how they succeed. Um, our research and discovery, um, the importance to us is that it's of public value. And then finally, that we um, as a university have a fundamental responsibility for the community that we serve. And, and we define community, um, you know, both as our local community, but also national and global community. And we really do feel that we have a responsibility to contribute to the well-being of our community. And so that you can see in, in, in our design aspirations that comes through, um, you know, some of the ones to highlight, you know, transforming society or conducting youth inspired research. Um, engaging globally and uh, it, fusing intellectual disciplines. That's also a very strong thing with ASU is the interdisciplinary focus of the work that we do. All of which I think align with the SDGs. So our, um, like I said, we've been doing a lot in SDG work for decades now, um, but it hasn't been, uh, we haven't really organized ourselves um, in our thinking about the SDGs until more recently. Um, and one of the big incentives for that was our participation in the Times Higher Ed Impact Rating, which as, as I'm sure many of you, uh, all of you know, is based around the SDGs. Um, so we participated in both years of it. Um, and what I have here is just a graph showing you um, kind of how we did across across the two years. Um, we, uh, we participated really the first time in 2019. It was a very labor intensive process and it re really, um, showed us a lot about both where we were at and what we needed to do to organize. Um, we really, and I'm not sure, I'm getting a lot of feedback. I'm not sure if there's people are able to mute. Um, I don't know if other people are hearing that as well, but I'm hearing a lot of kind of background noise. Yeah, you know, Lewis, can you mute? Thank you, perfect. So, um, so like I said, we, uh, it was a very labor intensive process and we learned a lot about kind of our, our own university. One of the big problems with a university the size of Arizona State is that often, you know, person in one department or one office often doesn't know what their, what their neighbor or you know, in the department down you know, across campus is doing. So it was a really good exercise in, in just really reaching out and, and pulling together and identifying. And we ramped that up for our second submission and um, that kind of shows in the progress that we made. So 
we were really, really excited when the rankings came out this year and uh, Arizona State University was number one in the United States and number five globally. Um, and some of the ones that we really highlighted or, or were particularly proud to highlight was uh, we were number one in SDG one. So in, in, in fighting poverty, number three on SG 14, life below water, which is only slightly ironic given that Arizona State is a landlocked state, but uh, we have a lot of really amazing experts working in doing, in doing work um, on water. And then uh, life on land, we were number six um, for that one. So like I said, it, it really has prompted um, us to examine how we are thinking about the SDGs and, and more importantly, um, how that is influencing how we organize. And I'll give you a couple examples of this. Um, and part of this I do, I believe too, has been um, influenced by our global partnerships. Um, as I mentioned, I am the director for global strategic partnerships and we have a number of different partnerships with universities um, overseas. Um, one is the Plus Alliance, which is King's College London, University of New South Wales and ASU. And uh, that has really influenced our thinking on using SDGs as an organizing force. Um, and we've been able to, you know, through our interactions with them, through our collaborations with them, really kind of adopt a lot more. So the Plus Alliance, all of the research that we do is really structured around the SDGs, and that's our organizing framework for that. Um, we have a number of initiatives in our, in our, um, across our university, but also in our alliance that are really specifically targeting SDG work. Um, the Plus Alliance is about to launch a women's leadership event that's going to run over the month of October and that's looking across 10 different sectors about how can we transform pathways so women can advance in leadership. So very timely, um, very important work. Um, and, and working with the, the impact ranking has been has been a real key part of that. So we now actually have an SDG task force, which we call the SDG and beyond, um, where we're looking at how do we want to um, pull across all our researchers that are that are working on the SDGs? How do we want to elevate that, make that more visible and increase the networking and inter interactivity between those? Um, so one of the things that we've done actually is with the data from Elsevier, um, with the data on the research from that we had gathered with Times Higher Ed is we're doing a network mapping of all of our faculty here who, you know, working across the different SDGs. And our plan is to both then elevate their work, um, identify it as being really important in the SDGs, but also look for ways to connect those faculty um, ac across their work there. So I'll just share one, um, one last one here about what we're doing at ASU. Um, ASU um, has undergone a transformation over the last 16 plus years with President Crow. And one of the big parts is really breaking down boundaries between disciplines um, and taking a very interdisciplinary approach. You can see that in some of our institutes like the Biodesign Institute. One of our most recent ones that we've launched is the Global Futures Laboratory. This was literally just launched in September as the Global Futures and it's bringing together both academic programs, academic um, colleges, as well as separate institutions, research institutions. Um, so we have the newly formed College of Global Futures, which is bringing together three different schools. Our School of Sustainability, which was the first school of sustainability in the U.S. Um, the School for the Future of Innovation in Society, which I say is the most ASU degree possible and one of my favorites, actually. Um, but that is really thinking about how how are we navigating the future and all the changes in technology um, and, and giving some real thought to how we manage that in a way that is beneficial to society. And then uh, the school, for, school of Complex Adaptive Systems. So again, you see the interdisciplinary and the purpose around um, all the activities of the Global Futures is really to, um, it's, it's devoted to solutions um, for global, par global um, problems. Um, you know, President Crow said that we've decided it's in the collective interest of humankind to build something similar to and on the scale of a national laboratory um, that we have in the United States. But instead of being devoted to weapons or defensive strategy, it's going to be devoted to creative strategies and positive global futures. Um, so he also refers to, to the Global Futures Laboratory as a, it's a medical school for the earth. So really looking at some of the key things that are um, you know, throughout the SDGs and how are we going to be very creative in in, in addressing those issues. So that's just a little bit about how ASU is taking the work around the SDGs. 
um, and really uh, transforming our organizational structure and, and how we're um, collaborating both within our university and outside of our university. And it's a space that we're very excited to be in um, and to partner with great partners like Relics and Times Higher Ed and other institutions uh, you know, globally and nationally. Um, so with that, I'm very excited to introduce to you our two speakers um, and, and what they're going to present here. Um, so first, and I'm just going to go ahead and present both our speakers and then turn it over to them rather than kind of breaking. Um, but first, uh, Dr. Marcia Beliciano. Um, and uh, Marcia is the founding global head of corporate responsibility at Relics. Um, and like, you know, like many corporate responsibility, uh, their mission is to engage, um, well, theirs is to engage with business, but like many is to increase the positive contributions they make to society while minimizing the negative impact. What I found really interesting about kind of uh, Marcia's team is though, is given the field that they're working in, given the given relics, um, they have some really interesting specific goals around corporate responsibility that I think are relevant here. So that includes things like universal sustainable access to information, um, to the promotion of science and health, the protection of society, furthering the rule of law and fostering community. So given that context and given that framework, I'm, I'm very excited um, to hear Marcia's presentation. She's gonna be presenting on a newly published um, paper on the power of data to advance the SDGs. And I'm also hoping she might speak a little bit to the to um, Relic's SDG Resource Center. I've been playing around a little bit with that and it's a really phenomenal resource um, for people that are trying to find out what is some of the, you know, the best best practices around SDGs. And so that's, it's a really fabulous resource. So very excited to, to see that. Uh, following her presentation, we will hear from Dr. Lewis Collins. Um, and Dr. Collins is a lifelong fascination with the natural world and forces in particular climate change. Um, he has his undergraduate and master's degree in earth science and cl climate change, as well as his doctoral work that focused on uh, Antarctica, which I think is really fascinating. Um, and it's, and it, that really kind of cemented his focus on environmental change. So he's currently the editor in chief of One Earth um, and before which he helped to launch. And then prior to that, he led the editorial team for Nature Communications. So. Uh, we have a great, um, great group here to to share some information and to, to provide commentary on how we can really use um, the SDGs and the research around it to solve some of these global, global issues. So with that, I will, I think, stop sharing if I can. Oh. Actually, I'm not, I may, okay, I think I have stopped sharing. And I will mute and turn it over to Dr. Marcia Beliciano. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah. It is great to have this opportunity to share some information about a commitment that we put in the public domain at the beginning of this year. I am very grateful to the UN Global Compact for gathering us together in this important moment with Uniting Business Live the five-year mark of the SDGs, and we know we have so much to do even before COVID struck, and even more now, uh, given the challenges that it presents. I am very grateful to uh, Dr. Lewis Collins, my colleague um, at Cell Press and editor-in-chief, as you said, of One Earth, who will offer a comment on what I'm going to be talking about today. So um, you really did the hard work for me, Sarah, in uh, talking about our commitments. And, and one of them, as you said, is universal sustainable access to information. Um, so I'm going to say next slide, and hopefully that will, that will work. Um, Relics is a global provider of information-based analytics and decision tools for professional and business customers. What does that mean? It means that we are one of the world's largest uh, media and information and events companies. And we uh, have uh, different uh, business areas, which include Elsevier, which uh, Sarah, you mentioned, uh, helped with the research behind Times Higher Education 
work on identifying the academic institutions that are leading on the SDGs and congratulations to ASU for its work as uh, being recognized for first among uh, academic institutions in the United States on the SDGs. So we have Elsevier, we have also uh, LexisNexis Risk Solutions Group, which is looking at uh, data and analytics primarily to do things like prevent fraud and corruption. And we also have LexisNexis Legal and Professional, which is focused on access to justice, publishing the world's laws, making sure that they're transparent, uh, which surely maps to the SDGs, as I'll talk about, and then fostering communities through our face-to-face -face events business and other kind of uh, business areas. Where 13, uh, we, we're 33,000 employees around the world, and we are also located in about 40 countries. So as um, Sarah pointed out, our objective is to uh, ensure that we are aligning to the SDGs in the commitments that we make publicly, and one of those was to produce an SDG graphic for every SDG in this important year. So uh, we made this commitment, as I said, at the beginning of the year before we knew about uh, COVID-19, it seems even more relevant now. And in particular, it's an important year of anniversaries for the United Nations at the 75 year mark, and also at the 20th anniversary of the UN Global Compact, which is the compass for business around the world to align with the 10 principles of the Global Compact on human rights, labor, environment, and anti-bribery. So if we move on, uh, here I'm just showing you that we have these graphics. They are already live individually on the Relics SDG Resource Center. Thank you for flagging the Resource Center, Sarah. Uh, we launched the Resource Center in 2017. It's free content for the world from across our business on the SDGs, every SDG, as well as from key partners, including the UN Global Compact and other UN partners like UN Environment Program, UN Development Program, as well as others like Global Citizen, which um, helps to mobilize people to take action on the SDGs. So you can see on the right-hand side of the slide that we also have produced a report. So you can go to each SDG on the, the Resource Center and find the individual graphic. But as of tomorrow, live on the Resource Center as well will be the actual report where we draw some conclusions and you hear from uh, experts on the work that was undertaken. And just a word about the Resource Center, what else you can find there. You can see on the homepage that we have up to minute uh, news on the SDGs. So you can search by SDG for the news that is available at that moment that you're doing the search. And then for the previous 30 days, you can also search by geography and SDG if you're only interested in content from a particular part of the world, for example. And it's in every UN language as well as German. So let's move on. How do we do this research? So you'll see we say here it's about insights through data and powerful analytics. And you'll see two tools that my colleagues at, at Elsevier have developed. One is uh, Scopus, the uh, name on the bottom there, which is the world's largest citations database. And then SciVal, which is an analytical tool, which helps us to look at the various citations in Scopus. So to do these SDG graphics, we, we worked with search queries, and that reflects hours of work and hours of insight by experts in the field who help to develop these queries. And in fact, one of the exciting things that's happened this year with Scopus is that we have um, launched the alignment of the content in Scopus to every SDG. So that will really help researchers wanting to dig in and understand detail around the Sustainable Development Goals. We have also, on the RELX SDG Resource Center, 
uh, launched a tool where you can look at an individual citation and choose which SDG it relates to and in particular which target. So we're sort of crowdsourcing insight into the SDGs. So we ran the search queries in Scopus and then we extracted the publication sets. And that's when we use SciVal, the analytical tool, which we use to calculate the metrics that I'm going to present. And then we also did some additional work. So Elsevier has the International Center for the Study of Research, and they applied sex and gender keywords to the publications. And you'll see more about that in a few minutes when I show you how that overlays on the 17 SDGs. So moving on, you can see that SDG 3, Good Health and Well-Being, has the largest share of publications. So there are um, over 3 million publications that relate to SDG 3, Good Health and Well-Being, um, over a period uh, which um, was between uh, 2000 and uh, 15 and 2019. So uh, here, all of the publications that related to the 17 SDGs was 4 million. So you can see that um, SDG 3 is really uh, taking the lion's share of research attention. SDG 17, Partnerships for the Goals, had the least amount of research with only 229 publications. So actually in the report that I flagged, we, uh, we produced a separate graphic, which you can find for SDG 17 on the Resource Center, but we've only um, highlighted some, some kind of overall findings in the report on SDG 17. And if you look at that diagram, you'll see that it has the, the smallest sliver of information. Going on, research is growing for almost all SDGs. SDG 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities, had the highest growth rate. And SDG 3 and SDG 16 had a um, growth rate which was below average uh, relative to the others, which were all growing. We think SDG 3 had a smaller share of uh, compound annual growth because it's already at an extremely well-researched um, area of uh, the SDGs and SDG 16. It was growing mildly in the years that we that we looked at. However, um, in the final year, um, 2019, there was a contraction. So that's why it, you see that it's actually a negative growth there. Um, and um, overall, you can see that SDG three had the lowest growth rate. Moving on, high income locations, unsurprisingly, produce the most research. And if you look at that diagram, what you'll see is that there's a little small yellow dot in the center of that diagram, and that represents publications by low income countries. And they have the smallest share. And high income countries in the blue have, have the largest share and um, scaling um, smaller is upper middle income and then lower middle income countries. So 67% of SDG research comes from high income countries and 79% um, is SDG 5, gender equality, which has the largest share of research from high income locations. And the lowest share from high income countries is SDG 2, zero hunger, and I will talk a little bit more about what our suggestions are based on the research findings. Moving forward, we can see we, uh, there's limited research from low income locations. So less than 1% of SDG research came from low income locations. And that is not, um, that's a concerning statistic because low income countries are on the forefront of challenges that are represented by the SDGs, like um, No Poverty, SDG 1, like Zero Hunger, SDG 2. The second statistic here is 2.9%, which is SDG 17 on partnerships for the goals. They had the highest research share from low-income countries. 
and 0.04% SDG 14, life below water, um, had the lowest research share from low-income countries. Moving forward, the SDG research interests of lower income locations is what we're looking at here. I found this very interesting. If the total amount of publications from high income countries um, is unsurprising, what is surprising is the relative activity index. This is a metric in the simplest way to explain it, which looks at the share of research output relative to a location's total research. And these four SDGs had the highest RAI. And if you look at one, um, SDG one, no poverty, Ghana had the highest RAI at 18. Kenya, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, Nigeria, South Africa, Indonesia, Colombia, Pakistan, Malaysia. What that shows is that on SDG one, those countries are producing a significant amount of research relative to, the, to all the research that's put out by that location. And we see that similarly with SDG 2, where Niger had, uh, was in the first position, Mali in the second, Zimbabwe in the third position. On gender equality, very interestingly, Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania in the first three um, spots. And on SDG 10, reduced inequalities, Ghana, Luxembourg, and South Africa had the three uh, highest places for the relative activity index. Again, the share of the research output relative to that location's total research output. Going on, we can see that academic impact and international collaboration is strong. So there's a statistic here of 34.5% SDG 13 climate action research uh, it has the most international collaboration, and it also has a high impact factor. And um, the metric that we're using, it's just one, but it's field-weighted citation impact. You can see that on the right side of the graph. And if it's over 1%, um, or, or over 1 as, um, as the metric, then it's considered to be um, a high impact. And SDG 4, quality education, was the only SDG with an impact factor below the global average of all the SDG research fields. Going on, low income location collaboration with high income locations is really critical. So I mentioned that uh, we are concerned by the findings that show that low income countries have the lowest share of total output. But here's something that's quite interesting, that the discrepancy between these two metrics on the left-hand side. So 7%, that relates to the highest share of high-income location collaboration with low-income locations. So of the publications that um, were put out by high-income countries, um, they had the highest collaboration with low-income countries uh, relating to 7% of the research output. And, and the average for SDG 1, no poverty, SDG 2, zero hunger, and SDG 5, gender equality, were all um, hovering around 7%. But look at the second metric, 73%. That's the highest share of collaboration for low-income locations with high-income locations. And the average was similar for both SDG 4, quality education, and SDG 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. So what that's showing is that uh, approximately 73% of the research in those two fields resulted from collaboration between high and low income countries. So the low income countries uh, were producing the research, but it was the result of, um, of significant engagement with high income countries. And if we go on to sex, gender, and SDG research, here you can see that um, gender equality, unsurprisingly, when we apply that the sex and gender keyword filter to the SDG research that we've done, SDG 5 has the lion's share 
of research that is uh, relating, uh, incorporates uh, sex and, and or gender factors. So SDG 5 and SDG 3, uh, gender equality and good health and well-being, um, were the only two that had greater than 60% of publications factoring in sex or gender. And then as you go down here, for less than 40% for all other SDG publications um, included any uh, specific referencing or um, significant space to sex or gender factors in their research. And uh, something striking for me, for example, as you go down uh, the chart, if you look at something like SDG 8, Decent Work and Economic Growth, which affects men and women both, it's only 8% of that research which had um, which factored in gender and um, sex-related issues. Going on, my final slide before I turn over to Lewis is, so what? And here are some recommendations. Um, there are others, but these are three that I wanted to point out. More international collaboration is needed to address the global challenges. So research produced by collaboration between different countries generally shows a higher impact factor than research with lower levels of international collaboration. So if you are a research institution and you're producing content with others, it's going to be cited more, it's gonna have a higher impact factor um, and that means that a community of peers thinks that that research is more impactful. The next recommendation is to support the research needs of low-income countries. Most research SDGs have a strong relevance for industrialized countries. For example, SDG 3, Good Health and Well-Being, SDG 7, Affordable Clean Energy. But SDGs that address issues affecting the world's poorest for example, SDG 1, No Poverty, um, as I said earlier, and SDG 2, Zero Hunger, are researched less. And moreover, as I was mentioning a few moments ago, collaboration with higher income locations is critical to advance their research output. And then, as we saw in the previous slide, gender equality needs to be broader than SDG 5, Gender Equality. Gender must be considered in all the SDGs to ensure gender responsive efforts in investments, policies, programs to ensure a fair implementation across all the SDGs. And I already gave that uh, reference that only 8% of research on SDG 8, decent work and economic growth um, encompasses gender issues. But you could also look at any of the others, 7% for responsible consumption and production, 7% um, on sustainable cities and communities, 5% um, on clean water and sanitation. So these are issues that also uh, affect uh, women around the world and particularly women in the poorest countries. So I think I'll stop there, lest I take up all the time, and I turn over to Lewis so that he can offer some of his thoughts. Thanks, Marcia. Um, so, as mentioned at the beginning, my role uh, as editor in chief is overseeing One Earth, a new journal that we launched uh, last year. Just just had our um, one year anniversary, and it's an interesting perspective for me to have as being part of Relics from a publishing aspect in these these bigger events that that, that take place. Um, in contrast to what I see, which is the individual papers coming in and being published, um, or not being published, depending on that pesky thing called peer review. So where I, where I sit, um, you know, I see the 2030 agenda for sustainable development as being you know, incredibly ambitious and rightly so when we consider the alternative. But one of the, the, the huge realizations for me during my time um, in publishing is this, this realization of how complex these issues are um, and how, how interconnected the, the challenges we face today really are and how that's changed a number of trends in research, in, re research over the last five to 10 years and will likely do so in the future. 
So while we, we understand that these challenges exist, we understand the impacts they're having on people and planets, and we're, in a, we're aware of an extent, to an extent of these interactions, a huge number of gaps remain. And this for me is where science, research and innovation really come, comes, comes into effect um, and has a huge role to play. Particularly plugging these gaps, but also identifying new gaps of which sometimes I feel we're unaware. Um, but the problem for me, uh, and something that the report we've just heard about helps to, to, to plug this gap in particular, is traditionally the way that we really sort information um, hasn't always worked. This, this information deficit model will we'll gather more information, will learn more, and somehow magically will we'll arrive at solutions to some of these problems. That needs to change, and it is changing. Um, we heard this from Sarah, the fantastic efforts from institutes such as ASU, with different groups and communities coming together, and really breaking out of this disciplinary world, really breaking down those barriers, breaking down those silos. And it's really important that when we generate this information, when we share it, and when we package it, as we've just heard from Marcia, we do this in the context of challenges rather than disciplines, which has historically been the way that we've, we've catalogued and characterized science. If you look at um, indexes like Scopus, historically, again, you would search based on discipline. This movement towards searching, categorizing, um, collating information based on challenges is helping us map, monitor and make progress um, regarding the SDGs. What we've seen certainly during my time with the Nature Group uh, and now um, with One Earth is an increase in more integrated interdisciplinary research. And it's fantastic to see this. Again, historically, traditionally, many of the challenges we faced have been approached from a, a natural science perspective. And it's led to a huge number of insights and, and great understanding of these problems. We now really need to get to grips with the the societal behavior aspects, the policy aspects, um, the economic aspects, because that's how we're going to enact these solutions. And I feel in this decade, this decade of action, that's what this decade will be remembered for. It won't necessarily be remembered for the amount of information we've gathered or the amount of learning that we've, we've achieved. It will be remembered for the extent to which science has actually been enacted as policy the actions that we've taken. And some of the trends that we're seeing from, from this report are very positive in that respect. Marcia mentioned um, increased collaboration, um, the need to, the, the, we're seeing more higher income countries, capacity building through partnerships with lower and middle income countries. And that's really important, and particularly through partnerships. I think that's a crucial term here. We've seen in the past and, and today still um, examples of helicopter science where we essentially drop in, maybe extract information from lower income countries and then conduct the reports to the research science elsewhere. Um, parachuting research where facilities may be set up in lower income countries but are completely staffed and run by expertise in, 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 in the global north. We need to make sure that we are enhancing capacity and increasing collaborations between these groups for a variety of reasons. But one of the main issues here is the, the impacts of these challenges. I felt globally, but the most vulnerable I felt are feeling the impacts the most. Nations in the global south in particular, lower income countries, you know, especially women and children, much more so than men, if we don't increase this diversity inclusion in research, we won't have the perspectives, the worldviews, the knowledge to really generate the solutions essential to meet these challenges. What we've seen from this report um, today is an increase in trends in that direction, more inclusion, but as Marcia says absolutely correctly, we, we need to map gender equality across the goals. We need to ensure collaborations between the North and the South are the norm rather than the exception, as they certainly are right now. 
And we need to increase the science policy gap. Um, certainly from my perspective, the, the increase in interdisciplinary science is fantastic. And we have institutions supporting this. We have funders supporting this. Uh, and we have uh, initiatives that publishers supporting this as well through journals like One Earth, through initiatives like the, the RELX um, SDG Resource Centre. The next step for me, looking beyond um, this report and into the future, is that need to bridge the gap between science and policy, between science and society. Uh, and I think we, we are seeing again progress uh, in that direction. Um, moving beyond interdisciplinary research into transdisciplinary research where we're, we're seeing an increase in the, the co-creation of knowledge um, beyond academia uh, and for me that's the, the key aspect looking forward is we're managing now um, slowly but surely to break down the silos between disciplines it's, it's hard um, you no know, this is historically how we've operated it's happening, it's working, it's changing, fantastic. The next step is to then break down that barrier between science and society, science and policy, through making research accessible, um, through initiatives that involve stakeholders in the design stage of research, and re-establishing that foundation of trust in science. Now it's, it's a terrible situation we're in at the moment, not only the, the challenges we face, but also the erosion of the trust in science. You know, the, the fact that facts um, are now questionable and news can be fake. If there's one thing that COVID, I th think, has taught us, it's taught us many things, but there's one, one very strong element that if you don't trust in the science and you don't enact and follow that guidance, terrible things happen. Hopefully, coming together, funders, institutions, partnerships, publishers, we can help avoid these scenarios in the future. Um, and I'm certainly very excited to be part of an initiative like that. And events like this, I feel, you know, will help us make progress in that regard. So thank you. Thank you for the time today. Well, thank you both very much. That was really interesting. Um, we are open to any questions. So if you um, would like to ask a question of any of our panelists, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, while we're waiting for that, I'd like to start off, um, you know, if you're, you're preaching to the choir here as the Director of Global Strategic Partnerships, I obviously believe wholeheartedly that this is a critical aspect of what we do. Um, you know, one of the challenges that we frequently experience doing research in particular is that our funding mechanisms are very nationally, nationalistically centered. Um, there's, you know, and, and it does vary. Um, there's some funding schemes that will, I don't know, encourage might be a little strong, but I'll certainly allow for some cross-national funding. Um, but those are relatively few and far between. And I'm just curious to either one of our panelists thought on how we can start to encourage um, this, what we all you know, agree is really critical in terms of international collaboration um, by changing the way we fund um, and really recognition of the fact that many of these challenges that we're facing are global and, and, and don't, don't respect or recognize any boundaries. So we need to kind of have a shift in the way we think about funding as well. So either, either one of you, if you, if you have thoughts or hopefully an answer to, to that particular problem. <laughs> Well, uh, I'll jump in before Lewis and just say that hopefully this research that we've done provides the ammunition that's needed to say this is this is what has to be addressed going forward and um, showing that the collaborative research is more impactful than collaboration that's um, done by the institution on its own. So it's a real win-win. And the fact that you know we have we have a duty as researchers to share our knowledge and um, and it's it's not a it's not the West telling the rest. It's about learning um, from those that are at the forefront of those challenges. And if I give an example for us, so I think what this research does, you can think anything you want, but you need data 
So the, and even in a world of alternative facts, Lewis, we still, we still need data. And so having research like this, um, and it's indicative, provides some information that can show that uh, what the problems are and the fact that you know there's a you know shockingly small amount of uh, of research on these topics for the world are um, being produced by by low income con countries and and locations. So that's the problem. But for us as an organization, we also have to be part of the solution. So um, what are the ways that we can collaborate? And I have a really wonderful example uh, with ASU and the amazing ambassador, Amanda Ellis, who is um, one of the principals behind the Global Futures Laboratory, who I've had the good fortune to work with over the last few years. Uh, we are a dissemination partner of the We Empower SDG Challenge. This is a wonderful uh, program that supports women entrepreneurs working in any aspect of the SDGs um, in the um, different regions of the world. And they um, are all celebrated. Uh, and in fact, um, one of the things that we do under the auspices of our SDG Resource Center is we hold an SDG Inspiration Day. Um, very lucky um, that Lewis uh, helped and participated in that um, in June of this year. But we had um, our keynote speaker uh, was Grasa Michelle, who with her late husband, Nelson Mandela, was um, a founder of the Elders. And um, she's an SDG advocate on behalf of the Secretary General. And um, the ladies who were previous um, uh, we Empower winners were able to talk about their project and Grasa Michelle just was so amazed by these women and their various projects related to um, uh, life below water and um, improving access to clean energy and you know some of these other projects. Uh, it really shows that we can work together with organizations to uh, do our part to be among those working towards solutions. Uh, yeah, I'll, I just I would just add to that on the you know, the question of you know, how do we how do we go further? How do we um, engage with with individuals, different experiences and perspectives from the places that, that matter that are being impacted the most? I think one aspect is visibility, certainly. Um, it's something that certainly as a journal at One Earth and you know, as a publisher, um, Cell Press and Elsevier, providing platforms and providing that visibility for some of the great research that does emerge um, from these parts of the world that often is overlooked is really important. I think historically, from a publishing perspective, there's been um, a tendency towards publishing big, shiny, global scale papers, whereas you know, the reality is that we're looking at local solutions to global problems. That's, that's, what, that's what will make the difference here. It's not going to be, well, we've tried to have a, a global top-down um, uh, solution to these problems and it hasn't really worked. It hasn't, hasn't been manifested yet, um, although there's still hope. We have seen fantastic um, progress um, from a grassroots perspective. And I think moving in a direction from a publishing perspective to giving those studies um, a bit more visibility, um, benefit of the doubts in cases, and championing that research is something that we can do and uh, we are trying to do. Um, now, there are funders out there, which I'm aware that are now requiring that there is a, um, a collaboration with um, a, a nation from the global south or a university from the global south and we're seeing those papers come through the the, um, the submission spectrum now and they do tend to offer you know, a fantastic new perspective um, I think the issue with with funding is certainly always a case of there needs to be success demonstrated before um, that, before it's uh, reproduced and, and funding is, is pushing that direction. Um, and, and individuals, uh, certainly the people that I speak with 
from different universities, different research institutes, levering those personal connections, um, those individual um, networks and bringing people on board um, projects where you know funding can maybe be be um, be applied that's already been awarded by a certain grant is a way to make this happen. But as a as an answer to the the question of solution, unfortunately, um, I guess we'll we'll have to wait and see. Thank you for those comments. Um, so we do have a question in our chat, and it's how can we convince companies that consumers and customers really do care about climate change? I don't know if Luis, you want to take a stab at that one? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a huge challenge because of the the, the complexity and the, um, the the long term impact, I think, of climate change. You know, it's not it's not something that we we experience here and now. Um, we, I mean, we do in short ex, in short um, extreme events um, like the, the wildfires we're currently seeing uh, in, in California, um, but they're they're forgotten too quickly. I think that that's one of the problems. So you don't have this this kind of um, residence time within the, the memory of, of these impacts. Um, convincing companies, I mean, acting um, as individuals is, you know, is one approach. Um, but I think companies certainly, you know, as parts of a, of a large company, there is, there is responsibility there for, for corporations and companies to, to act. And that's something that, that Marcy can certainly speak to much better than I can in terms of ensuring that this responsibility is enacted through action rather than, than promises. I think that's something that, that we don't often see. Um, but it, it's a two way game, I think. You know, um, customers can can vote with their uh, you know, their own actions in, in purchasing um, and the role that they play, but there's a responsibility at the corporation level now. And I think we, we are seeing massive strides being made in that direction. And when we look at initiatives such as the Race to Zero, um, the number of individual um, corporations that are signing up to that um, far you know, outnumber, um, almost in terms of emissions, the, the countries that are signing up to that pledge. So we are seeing progress, um, but it is, it is a two-way street. I think customers can, can act um, with their choices, but corporations have a responsibility as well. I, I just wanted to add to what uh, Louis was saying. Um, we know that it matters to customers because they, they tell us it does. They contact us every week to ask for or nearly, um, and not just the corporate responsibility team, but to our colleagues who are uh, working on the front line of our business. Uh, they want to know that we, as a, as a um, provider of our content, information, tools, data, events, etc., are, are going to meet their requirements on being a responsible company, which includes um, environmental issues and, and, in particular, climate change. So we get requests for information or requests for proposals or contract renewals. This is coming up with greater frequency. We know it's important to our board. For example, um, I recently prepared a paper for our board and have had a chance to discuss it, um, these issues uh, you know, on a, a fairly um, frequent basis. But the paper was on um, the TCFD requirements, which are um, looking at helping companies to do scenario planning about where they are and where they need to be to do their share on climate change um, to keep the world at one and a half degrees um, in the next uh, years ahead. We also know that it does indeed um, matter to um, our employees because they tell us that they want to work for a good company and I hear that from not only colleagues who are on the recruitment side but those who are uh, looking at development opportunities 
And so, for example, we have green teams, which are incredibly popular. These are employee-led environmental groups um, that help to translate our environmental targets, which we have, um, and make those real on the ground. So it is, um, those are two examples, and maybe one other one is around our investors, because increasingly we see a focus on ESG, environmental, social, and governance criteria. This has risen so high up the agenda in how we as a company are being assessed for not only our near-term profitability, but our long-term sustainability. And can I just flag, because I know our time is, is running low, Sarah, that if you want to hear more of Lewis's amazing comments, um, I had the chance to interview Lewis uh, for a podcast series uh, that is available from the Relics SDG Resource Center, looking at the impact of COVID-19 on the SDGs. So you can find that um, under the Resources tab on the Resource Center. And you can hear um, more of what Lewis had to say over about a 30-minute conversation. That's wonderful. Thank you. And just a thought that I had building on both what you have said is, um, you know, how do we get that data on what corporations are doing out to the general public in a way that's accessible and digestible so they can make those informed decisions? You know, or so you said you have people co you know, contacting you all the time. But I think a lot of people don't know where to go to look to get that information. And so if we can make that um, more easily accessible, that'll give people the information they need to then, you know, make those decisions and, and incorporate that information. So, well, so we are just about, oh, go ahead. Well, sorry. I was just going to say that's really a holy grail, isn't it? There are many holy grails, but having information that's comparable across companies on what they're doing is challenging. That's why... Uh, various indices like um, CDP on the environmental side, or, or I'm sorry for all these acronyms, uh, like the initiative that I mentioned, um, uh, TCFD. But also, we're here under the auspices of the United Nations Global Compact, and each company has to prepare its communication on progress. And I know that my colleagues at the Global Compact are looking at how they can make the information from um, more than 10,000 uh, business signatories of the Global Compact available. And so let's watch this space because the more transparent we are, the better and the better for all our stakeholders. We are just about at the end of their time, so I want to just take the opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Beliciano and Dr. Collins. It was really fantastic to hear about the work that's been going and the commentary that you provided. It was really just kind of uh, made me think of, uh, you know, about some things about how we're, how we're approaching the SDGs, um, how we're approaching science and policy that we could probably spend several days uh, just discussing that. So I um, very much enjoyed it, and thank you both for your contributions. And thank you, everyone, for attending, and hope you enjoy the rest of the events here. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Thank you Lewis.